So let me get started. This is some joint work, work with Alina Irwin and Mark Partridge from Ohio State. And Marlon is um, the co-editor of the Journal of Regional Science with Mark. Um, so that's how he knows all about my research. <laughs> and um, hopefully you will find this interesting. We, this is a working paper, so definitely interested in comments. And also just one other note. Um, Part of my appointment at Cal State is I run a regional economic forum and a bunch of other sort of outreach oriented things. And so between getting my teaching up and running and th that up and running, I was wrapping up old things and I'm finally kind of back to having new projects in the works. So that was kind of the delay, even though Jen had invited me some time ago. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to talk today about is examining the motivations for a business location. And clearly, the, the main motivation for any business when it decides where it's going to locate has to do with whether it's going to maximize its profits. So the factors about a location that would affect profits include things like access to markets and inputs, the availability or land of land or space, the cost of inputs, agglomeration benefits from co-locating with s similar businesses or just um, other businesses in general, and other unique factors of, of any location. So what are policymakers' motivations then for understanding business location decisions? Well, number one, they want jobs, period. Right? That's the reason they care why businesses locate in, their, in a specific area. And with the current recession and the sort of ongoing economic restructuring that we have in this country, that's increased this pressure on the need to have new jobs. And especially in places where job growth is especially stagnated, okay, and has been for some time. So policymakers are clearly recruit motivated to recruit businesses to their location or to get people to start their new business in their location. And this is evidenced by um, some work by Fisher that shows there's been an increase in incentives to get firms into specific locations. The paper that I'm going to present today focuses on Greater Cleveland. But I'm going to talk about, as I go throughout this, how what you're going to see with Greater Cleveland is not unique to Greater Cleveland and is actually relevant to any highly developed city with an industrial legacy. In Cleveland area, you can see that the unemployment rate is extremely higher than the national unemployment rate, just as we see parts of the LA region continuing to have greater unemployment rates than the, than the, than the nation. And the Cleveland metropolitan region has a strong industrial legacy. There are power, points in, and power plants in it. There are areas with high levels of local pollution, lots of pollu highly polluting industries, Superfund sites, brownfields, degraded sites, the kinds of things that make places potentially unatt unattractive to certain types of businesses. So the perp for this study purpose, we're going to look at Greater, Greater Cleveland Metropolitan Area. And if you're not familiar, it's that area in Northeast Ohio. It's the five counties that make up the metropolitan region. And we're going to examine the choice at the census track level. And that's what all these different shaded areas are. In Ohio, there's been a lot of use of state incentives to recruit businesses, to get businesses to locate in their area. It can help new, they can help new businesses, they can recruit businesses from out of state, and they also have this perverse um, sort of situation where they've been moving businesses from one part of a metro area to another, and if you're familiar with the Bob Evans restaurant, it's a family restaurant, and they actually moved their headquarters from Columbus to a suburb of Columbus. So even within a metro area, these incentives can cre create these changes in where businesses are located. And clearly, these can be combined with other types of incentives. So lo localities in Ohio are really interested in trying to get these firms to start up or locate in their, in their area, just like localities are everywhere. So the objective of, of this paper, then, is basically to explore the factors that lead to new business establishments. We want to examine the role of pollution and industrial legacy. We want to look at the role of agglomeration. 
And specifically, we want to help policymakers understand how the relevance of these factors varies by industry. So are these industrial legacy effects repelling certain industries or repelling firms in certain industries, even though they may be good for recruiting firms in highly polluting industries? And the innovation here is that the previous work has not been conclusive about this particular question, as looking at many, many industries at such a fine geographic level. Okay, so that, that's what we're doing here. So the basic theoretical background of this is this sort of standard economic theory that firms choose locations to maximize profits. And households are gonna then choose locations to maximize their utility. And the factors that affect profits, however, are gonna affect the cost and availability of labor, which is influenced by household decisions. So following Roback, the attributes of a location can cause utility and profit differences, but in locational equilibrium, then firms are gonna have maximized their profits versus other locations, just as households have maximized their utility. While I'm going to focus on the firm side of this problem, we cannot ignore the fact that firms' decision, firms' optimal locations depend on the optimal locations of households. They're interdependent. So there is a huge literature that has looked at household location choices. In fact, I have another working paper where I'm looking at the household location choices in this same region, looking at some of the same factors. Using, following Rosen, people have used the hedonic price model to look at all kinds of attributes of localities or, or, or local places, including things like the kinds of things I'm going to examine today, water quality, air quality, pollution, those kinds of things. And the structurally model, structural modeling approach, which is coming out of the Eppel and Sieg and Bayers and Timmons work, um, is looking at the utility maximizing choice of households to live in a specific location. Out of that work, one, one, potent, one finding is that industrialization and pollution can repel households. It can, be, it can decrease utility. Maybe not surprising, but they're finding evidence of this in, in this work. But what about the firm side? And that's the part that hasn't been explored as, fa as far. So the thing here is that the impact of industrialization or pollution on business location could be different than it could be for households. So there's some evidence from some work by Gabriel and Rosenthal and Jeppesen et al. that finds that the factors that negatively affect households may actually help the profits of businesses. Okay? There's also the fact that the location decisions of firms depend on the availability of workers. So in the Glazer et and Kahn 2001 paper, they find some evidence that firms follow workers, at least in some industries. So will this household avoidance of pollution and industrialization thus lead to fewer firms? How do, we may not be able to disaggregate which effect it, it is causing it, but we can see if there is a negative effect on firm location. So much of the previous literature thus looking at firm location starts with a vast literature that looks at the location of ma manufacturing firms. This is just a few of the many, many, many uh, you know, papers that have been published looking at the location of, of manufacturing firms. Many of them are also at the state level. So what factors affect this manufacturer locating a plant in California versus Texas? That's as fine-grained as they've gotten. There's been a few that have looked at spe specific industries, including the one by Schutz that looks at retail service for firms in New Zealand, although it's kind of unclear how transferable that might be to the US. And the focus has been on a vast array of things, taxes, environmental regulations. This one is the most relevant to the work that I'm looking at. And List and Jefferson et al. both find that there's some evidence that looser environmental regulations, i.e. more potential for pollution, can attract more businesses. But guess who they're focusing on? Manufacturing. Okay. Then there's energy prices. There's some work looking at energy prices and firm location. 
incomes. This is the retail paper I mentioned before, and a number of papers that look at agglomeration. I am just giving some examples here. There are a lot of other papers that look at this, but many of them focus on the state level choice, and many of them are about manufacturing. So while some of the literature models the location of all businesses or employment, others follow the explicit choice of a firm to establish a new location following Bartik and some subsequent work that he did. So in general, the literature models new firm location using one of two methods, conditional logit or exploiting the, the equivalence of Poisson with, with conditional logit using the Poisson model. Okay? So this is what's been done so far. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about where I come in into this picture. Okay? So our empirical pr approach then is that we're going to use the Poisson quasi-maximum quasi likelihood model to model the location choice of new establishments, so a firm that's opening up shop in a particular location in the Cleveland metropolitan area from 1993 to 2007. Okay, we're going to model the choice of locations at the census tract level. Now, one of the things that I like about the Poisson is that we have counts of new, of new businesses. And so Poisson distribution is discrete counts. And so it fits the data better than some of the other distributions might. But one of the nice things about using this quasi-maximum likelihood model with Poisson is that, as Wildridge shows in, in, showed in 2010, is that even if the data do not fall, follow a Poisson qu model, then the quasi-maximum likely te uh, likelihood techniques will still provide a consistent estimate of the coefficients. Okay, so that's it's really important because Otherwise, you would need to have it be exactly Poisson. And the way we're going to model it is going to avoid the issue that you always have with conditional logit, where you have to worry about the IIA or the independence of irrelevant alternatives assumption um, when we use this approach. We're able to control for many other factors. And if you want to see more about this whole proof, which I'm not going to do here because it's not my, my proof to, to prove, this is all in that prior paper that I mentioned before, the Guamares et al. 2003 and 2004 do a really nice job of outlining um, how this, this proof works. Okay. All right, so what's our model then? Going back to the sort of theoretical underpinnings, we're going to model a, a, a profit maximizing firm's decision to locate in a specific location, i.e. a specific census tract in the greater metropolitan Cleveland region. So each business is going to choose a specific location at time t from a set of possible locations, all of the census tracts in Cleveland metro area, that gives them the maximum profit. So the underlying assumption then is that whatever location they choose, J star, right, is the one where their profit is higher than it would have been anywhere else or at least as high as it would have been everywhere else. Okay, otherwise they'd have an incentive to pick a different location. Okay, going back to sort of the spatial equilibrium approach. And we're going to explicitly model factors that, that affect profit will vary based on location and time. So census tract A in 1993. And these will be things such as pollution and industrialization variables. So we've got pollution variables, some of these other historic industrialization variables. We've got them each year at the tract level. Factors that also change with the industry. So these are going to be factors that may be different for one industry than another. Non-time varying factors. Okay, so when you see my data, I've got things like how far is the census tract from downtown Cleveland? Clearly that doesn't change because we're going to use 2,000 census tracts, so 2,000 census tracts don't move over time. And we're going to use industry time and location factors for which we may not have data. You can think of these as fixed effects. 
Okay, so we're going to control for things about the industry that we don't have data for. We're going to control for things about 1993 that might be different than 2007. And we're going to control for things about the location that, you know, our, our time in varying and yet we don't have data for. Okay. So that's the idea of the model. Given that, we can write this complicated probability <laughs> that an investor in industry K, and we have industry K1 to K, will choose at time T, we'll choose census tract J as this. Okay? So let me walk you through it a little bit. We are purposely using an H subscript on this fixed effect because once you control for census tract fixed effects, it sucks up the explanatory value of a lot of other variables that may be time varying, but not by much. So we want to see, plus we weren't sure going into this, whether we would be able to get any information if the values don't change much over time by using census tract fixed effects. So we're going to look at models where we use county as H, where H is township, which is bigger than census tracts, but below the, the county size, and where H is actually equal to the J or the number of tracts. Okay, so I was, I'm very, very purposeful in changing that fixed effect from J to an H, so that we can try these different kinds of controls. Because we believe that the importance of certain factors varies by industry, right? This is, this is why it matters, right? If we believe that all the results about manufacturing are the same for all industries overall, then this work would not be an innovation. But we believe that different industries respond to these industrialization and pollution effects differently. And so we're going to interact the industry term with pollution and industrial, industrialization factors, and that's what I'm calling this Y environment. Okay? And then we're going to also interact the industry fix effects with the industry agglomeration measures in our original control variables, and these are going to be agglomeration variables. Okay? So we're, a subset of our original control variables is going to be interacted with our industry measures. Yes? So I have a question. So your model is, is presumably based on export industries? That it's all industries. Well, there's different location, you know, decision criteria for service industries. And so that's why we're interacting these things. Okay, so that would be picked up in the interaction. That's our hope. That's our hope. Because yes. uh, if you have consumers to worry about, that's much messier than if you're just shipping yes. on the highway. Yes. Yes. So that's our hope. Now, uh, if my current models and results don't convince you, I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we're talking about doing that maybe try to get even closer to that in the end. But that's our hope. We're trying to, by doing these interactions, right, we're able to say these effects are different for different industries. Okay, so again, our innovation here is that we're considering the business location for all industries, and we're allowing the impact of these variables to vary by industry. Okay, so to address your concern, we're not saying that the effect is the same for all industries. We're actually, by those interactions, we're trying to capture that they may be very different. One of the things that we believe we're able to do at, by focusing on a single metro area is that we can ignore things that are common across the metro area that may also affect location choice. So there's been you know, lots of work that's looked at state tax policies and state labor laws and their impact on manufacturing firms. Well, this is all Ohio, so it's not going to change. Okay? Additionally, I don't mention it here, but this, this whole area is, you know, is served by one single utility. So energy prices for any given industry, since we are using industry fixed effects, should capture the fact that anyone in that industry faces energy prices that are similar. Okay, so that's the idea. This is, this is nice because then it allows us to, to focus on the things we care about. It's much harder if you're doing it across states. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about the data. 
And then this will help you understand the industry code question that you asked. So we're gonna, the data we're going to use are from the National Establishment Time Series database. And this database gives detailed establishment level data, including employment, industry code, things like is a woman owned, do they, is it foreign owned, there's a whole bunch of other details in there that I don't use in this, in this model. And what we do is we group these into 15 common industry categories using the two digit NAICS code. In a couple slides, you'll see when I start to look at the results, the specific <laughs> industries that we do. But these are things like, you know, agriculture obviously is by itself, government's by itself, and then we, we disaggregate some of the services, but some of them are so small, we have to aggregate a few of them together. But we're really trying to get an idea of these are 15 categories. This is not, you know, three categories, which I agree would be much more problematic. Our dependent variables in our models are going to, first we're going to, look, we're going to basically pool all industries together and say, we don't actually believe there's differences. What does that say about the relationship with these different variables? We're going to start with that. And then we're going to go to the real innovation of the model, which is looking at number of new businesses in an industry in a tract in a year. Okay. Again, our year is 1993 to 2007. There's 670 census tracts in the greater, greater Cleveland area. Okay. And actually having a lot of census tracts or a lot of a large choice set is important for making sure that you don't get an upward bias on your Poisson um, estimates. Okay, there's been some work that's looked at that. So the more disaggregated it can be or the more choices you can have, the more you can say this is equivalent to conditional logit. All right, so let's talk more about the data. Um, first, we're going to look at the location and time-specific variables, OK? And these are things like environmental and industrial. So we've got toxic release inventory, air pollution data, annual data in thousands of tons per census tract using data from the EPA, number of businesses in polluting industries in the tract using EPA definitions and our NETS data, the same data set. And if you want, when we're done, I can pull up a list. It's very specific, like six-digit NICS codes that EPA lists on all their top pollute, polluting um, industry lists as the top polluting industries. Okay, so we're controlling for that. The number of power plants within one mile of the center of the census tract. If a Superfund site is within one mile of the census tract. And... So those are our environmental things, the things that kind of this environmental industrial legacy. Okay? Then the other location and time specific variables are agglomeration. So we're looking at this sort of urbanization effect. So how many, yes? Sorry to ask, but yeah. um, did you also account for the drainage and noise producers so if you're a mirror, <coughs> do you? I do have distance to an airport in my model. But it's not considered one of these. Yeah, it's because it's not, it's distance to an airport doesn't change over time, so you'll see that in the time invariant model. Yes? In, in terms of other kind of pollution disaggregation, how have you treated that? Because obviously some pollutants are global in their harms, some are extremely local, perhaps even um, you know, a, a smaller radius in terms of their effect than the census tracts, for example, you know, some particulate matters. Are, been shown to not make it much further than um, 100 yards. So is there any way of... <clears throat> Unfortunately, the NETS data, while it claims to have a latitude and longitude um, in it, we've done some testing, and it's not accurate enough to put it to an address level. And it would take a lot of additional work to get it down to that kind of level. Um, we do have the addresses of all these polluters. But in order to get something that is meaningful at the census tract level, what we've done is we've just aggregated it up to the census tract level. But that, you know, that is a potential, a potential issue with what we're doing. And then the, just to put some more meat on that. So, you know, for example, the, some of the worst experienced pollution <coughs> in this region is in Riverside and the Inland Empire because of the you know, weather patterns and the topography such that you know it gets kind of trapped as it moves inland. 
you know, where, so there may be a lot of polluters in Santa Monica, for example, but less pollution because of the yeah. specific. Well, so one thing I can tell you about this area is that due to remote pollution, sort of like what you're talking about, this area is consistently in non-compliance with air quality standards. But the entire region is, is, is in non-compliance. So all five counties in the region are non-compliance. So I have, it's very difficult then for me to isolate, is there one particular spot that's being affected by this, you know, kind of out of state pollution that's hurt more than any other. The only thing I can tell you is there is a, there is a number of years in the middle of this time period that I'm exploring in which all the counties are suddenly in, in attainment, which I don't really know how that's possible. But because I have year fixed effects, I'll be capturing that with the year fixed effect. You know, this fact that like suddenly in this year, every single business that's in my entire model is no longer affected by non-compliance. But then when one county's in non-compliance, they're all in non-attainment. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but along with uh, the Vin's comment, I guess the TRI database does have you know different categories of pollution, yes. and they have this is the air this is the air pollution level for each of the air pollutants that they yeah. categorize. So you may be able to you know tease out some of the the most you know the the, the problematic uh, air pollution within that you know the, the TRI database because you can't just like you know lump them together and you know well, say so what, that they're all the same. So what I did was. Um, I, I basically take individual entities that have a minimum of, and you know what, I forgot to look at this number again because I did this data so long ago. I don't include any entity that has below a certain amount of pollution. And then for all the ones above that, I aggregate them to the census tract level. Okay, so, so it, it should be avoiding the really tiny ones. But what we want to say is overall, is this a tract with a lot of polluters? And if and I can get back to you with the exact cutoff that I used. I just literally put that data together a year ago, and I just can't remember what cutoff. But I did, to try to avoid the really kind of minor polluters, I did try to use just a level. But I could go back and look and see the more serious ones. You know, the, 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 you, know you want to have enough in some of these tracks so there's some identification, right, of some differences in, in, in the data. But I'll, uh, that's a good idea to look at the more specific types. But this is just air pollution is the only one I'm looking at. And it's localized air pollution. And my, my thought with the localized air pollution is that this, this whole area is a non-attainment for air quality because of distant air you know, pollution coming in. But if you live in a certain area or you're thinking about locating in a certain area as a firm or, or a person right, or a household, if you can see pollution, that could be a deterrent, right? Or if you see a lot of businesses that look, you know, not like places you want to locate if you're a household, then that could be a deterrent. So we're trying to control for that sort of local pollution effect. But I, I think we could try to improve it. It's, it's tough to get enough data sometimes that <laughs> so there's, I'm per I'd love to be able to do it at the local, at that firm level, but it's impossible to do. Thanks. The other thought, just again, I appreciate it's very difficult to find that data, but to what extent are kind of transportation pollution effects kind of included in the data? Well, I don't, I don't, I mean, they would, if they're a local, you mean, in t well, so that would be, you mean like in terms of, I do, I do control for distance to interstate highways, so I do have, I do have, you'll see that in a minute, I do have some controls for, you know, through the kind of through traffic or that kind of thing. Um, if it's not a business that has a set location, that wouldn't necessarily, sh that wouldn't show up in the TRI data, yeah. But I do try to have some other ways of controlling for, for these kinds of things. But these are great ideas, and please keep them coming, okay? Um, so let me then talk about the other things that are location and time-specific variables. And the thing that Jen mentioned, you'll see, and these other ones you'll see when I get to the location-specific, because some of them just don't change over time. So. We're going to look at the number of businesses per square mile total in, in the tract to kind of get this idea of this sort of urbanization, agglomeration. So this is a place with you know, a high density of businesses overall. And then we're going to try to control for other things associated with the business market, which at the census tract level is not as easy as you might think. But we're going to use um, 
sales data for houses in the particular year for that tract and get an average of the sales price and use the log of that sort of as a proxy for both access to markets, because there is housing activity here, as well as competition with housing. So if the house, the house price is higher, you may have a wealthier you know, clientele nearby, you know, someone that may be able to buy more retail goods, things like that. And then also if the house price is higher, then businesses are facing competition in terms of the price for, that they pay for land. Okay, so this has kind of two proxies there. And then, because I always, when I've presented this one other time at a conference, everyone's like, oh, but you know, these firms are just locating in the places that are doing best and all this stuff. So what I'm trying to do here is I use um, data from the BLS, the Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages, and I predict based on the number of firms in each industry in that tract two years earlier, how many firms would be in that, how many firms total would be in that tract two years later and get the change. Okay, so then in terms of location, time, and industry-specific variables, um, in addition to these like, you know, I'm going to look at industry agglomeration and clustering. So again, I'm going to look at for that particular industry, what's the number of fir firms per square mile in the census tract. Um, then I have some of these things that have now come up already <laughs> um, because I can't get, they don't vary over time, right? You know, these are census tracts and I'm using the 2000 census tract, you know, even, so this data has all been mapped to the 2000 census tracts. And so I have distance from the tract to downtown Cleveland, distance to Cleveland Hopkins Airport, distance to the closest interstate highway, things like the area. And then I've gotten a lot of feedback from people that have said, you need to be looking at brownfields. And so I'm going to show, I, I have put this in here, but let me tell you the problem with Ohio and brownfields. Ohio has self-reporting. And Ohio doesn't have a good historic database. <laughs> and so I have basically a static measure of brownfields. I'm going to throw it in there, but it has some of the same problems of some of the suggestions that Jen just made. But I'm doing it because I want to see if it, you know, a lot of these have been around for a while. So maybe it's not that strong of an assumption to say that they're time and varying during this period. But it is a problem with Ohio data, OK? period. Like I had to com com basically combine US EPA data, Ohio EPA, and I'm not even confident that there isn't stuff that's not in either database. I'm going to try the models with different levels of locational fixed effects to control for other things I don't observe. County, so there's just five counties. Township, I can't remember the number. And then census tract is for every single tract. Okay. All right, so other couple just comments about the model specifications. To avoid any issues of endogeneity and to account for the fact that firms are like looking at a location before they actually um, you know, open up shop, I'm going to use two-year lags for all my explanatory variables. Um, the standard errors are adjusted for over, over dispersion. So if, if, the, if the poisson doesn't hold, it'll still give you a, a consistent estimate, but you have to adjust for over dispersion, and I'm going to cluster at the census tract level since I'm using census tracts over time to adjust for that. And we're going to test the sensitivity of our results to some different specifications, as well as include some spatial spillover effects of our economic variables to try to see if we see anything there. And this gets a little bit to the uh, agglomeration stuff you were talking about. OK, so let's first look at everything combined. OK? And I'm, one thing I have to tell you is that the results for these kinds of models, they're, they're like this long, <laughs> right? Because I have all these interactions when I get to the industry stuff. So I'm going to focus on the key results, but I can t I'll try to talk about some of the other ones, OK? So these are the key results looking at our variables of interest in the model, OK? And you'll see at the bottom of every table that I'm going to show, you're going to see county, township, census tract. Okay, so that's the level of fixed effects in each model. Okay, so that's how you can read every, every table I'm going to show you will be set up the exact same way. Okay, so you know what level of fixed effects we're looking at. And so there's a couple of interesting things we see here. We see, first of all, that the number of polluting businesses in a tract seems to attract businesses. 
Wow, so you're a place with these really horrible, polluting businesses and new businesses want to go there. Interesting. Um, we see really strange stuff with the super fun stuff. Um, local air pollution starts off significant and goes away, as does Superfund. And then we clearly see some evidence of you know, these urbanization economies, businesses are op you know, opening where there's already a lot of other businesses. But I, the problem that I have with this is that this ignores everything that this paper is about. <laughs> Right? It ignores all the industry heterogeneity. So who knows what these effects mean? Right? They're an average of all these, ran all these different firms and in different industries over time starting up. And you know, one result you could say is if you did this, wow, if you have a lot of highly polluting businesses in your area, you should be able to attract new businesses. Okay? So I just show you that to show you the difference between that and what happens when we start to look at this industry heterogeneity. Okay, So first of all, I want to show you what sort of the fixed effects for the industries. Okay, So these are in every model. And um, somehow, and these are all using the census tract results so that I don't have to show you. They're all pretty similar in all the models. And in all of my results where I look at industries, I'm going to omit manufacturing. So everything is relative to manufacturing. Okay, so we're basically saying here we're saying that all else equal, you know, there's going to be fewer agriculture firms, you know, which is probably not surprising given this is a highly urbanized area. Um, fewer utilities, well, they don't, you know, you don't start up a new utility all that often. Um, but then you can see wholesale trade is even going down. But then some of the things you'd expect no matter what area you're looking at, retail going up. Um, well, information, remember this is the 90s and to early 2000s. Even though everyone thought those were where the jobs were, they didn't actually usually, for most places, they didn't go up. But education and healthcare, arts and entertainment, other services have more starts. The dependent variable is? Number of new businesses in an industry in a tract. In the track, so and then, and we've controlled for all the other things that were on your other slide. Your long regression results. Yeah, and I'm going starting to walk through the different, different pieces of it. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to start off by sort of showing there's clearly some differences in this in sort of the starts okay, of businesses so this is overall. This the everybody rec, um, estimation, and now this is the effect of, of essentially separating out. Yeah. So let me just clarify. So this was just. No, had no industry designations at all. All new starts, all businesses pooled together for any tract. So clearly there's no industry fixed effect in these. It's just year and area, and that's what you get. Even if you think, oh, wow, it makes it look like Superfund's bad. Well, OK, so that, you know, that's sort of consistent with your approach. I just think you, we, there's so much heterogeneity you know, that we, we are ignoring there. Okay, so the one I'm doing here is just sort of showing you if I just did the industry fixed effects, these are the kinds of results I would get. What I want to be clear on, these are the industry fixed effects in, a, in a, an estimation that has all the observations. Yes, 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 yes. So now my dependent variable is new businesses in an industry in a tract, okay, which everything else I'm going to talk about is about that. Okay, thank you. Sorry for any confusion about that. Okay, so let's look at agglomeration in this result. So like before, we start off by seeing that total employment density, you know, this sort of idea of an urbanization effect is good. But then once we add in the census track fixed effects, we don't see a lot of this sort of just overall lots of businesses in your tract per square mile is a good thing. But we do see some evidence of this like clustering or industry specific um, effect or the idea of localization, right, where basically firms want to locate in tracks that already have firms in their industry. Okay. That's the idea of that. Now, this particular one, though, is only for manufacturing. Because for everyone else, this is what I meant about the results, these are all the other industries. <laughs> okay, So the first row up here is the manufacturing results again. And then these are this industry employment density 
interacted with, e with each of the individual industry fixed effects. And you can see that there are a few that have even more localization benefits, and then a few where it's kind of negative, but you know, there's so many schools, so many hospitals, you're going to open a new hospital there? Maybe not. Um, but you know, some of these other ones that you'd expect, information, um, but anything that's not significant, it means it's still positive, okay? Because this is all relative to manufacturing. So this is the manufacturing effect. If they don't have anything statistically significant, then it doesn't mean there's no effect. It just means it's not statistically different than the manufacturing. Local air pollution then. Let's look at some more of these industry-specific results. So the way it'll work for the next few slides is I'll kind of do a summary, and then we'll see the long table again so you can kind of see what you're going to see. So we see that having local air pollution, even if it's this highly imperfect measure of it, seems to be weakly positive for new manufacturing firms. Probably not surprising, right? I mean, that's what a lot of the previous literature has found. Manufacturing firms are fine with locating in places that are polluting. But we do find these negative effects for things mostly service-oriented businesses, information, professional and business services, and other services. Then we use our measure of number of polluting businesses. Okay, so this is the number of businesses in the most polluting industries. And this is at the six digit NAICS level, so it's very highly disaggregated. And we find, again, a strong positive effect for manufacturing. So, and a lot of these are not, most of these are not manufacturing, refineries, all this other stuff. But they're like, fine, we'll just move there. We don't, we don't mind, there's other polluting businesses. But compared to manufacturing, we find that not surprisingly, retail, arts and entertainment, other services, government, even construction doesn't want to be in these places with highly polluting businesses. Okay, so let me walk through then local air pollution. You can see there's not a whole lot statistically significant, but we do have a few that are negative here. Okay, and then a few without the census tract fixed effects for, for manufacturing, your top row, your omitted category, the one that's not interacted, it's positive. Okay, then number of polluting businesses. This is the one where we see strong positive and statistically significant for, for manufacturing, and then quite a few negative and statistically significant for the rest of the industries. Okay, so this is evidence that relative to manufacturing, these firms are not interested in being in these places. Okay. What about proximity to power plants? I mean, if you're in a tract and there's a big power plant right there, there's probably only certain kinds of businesses that are going to want to be there. Well, so we find that there's really no overall effect. You know, manufacturing could care less one way or the other. But professional business services and finance, insurance, and real estate don't want to be located near these power plants. Superfund. We find that all industries, because we don't actually interact this one because there's not too much time var variance over time, but overall, the industry's overall effect is negative. Brownfields, no association with establishment of new firms. Now, this could just be because I have a pretty bad Brownfields measure. Okay? And there's absolutely no way I can fix this. Okay? In other states, you might be able to get better data, but unfortunately, with Ohio, you just can't. Okay, so again, here's the power plants, and you can see there's a few that are relatively negative, but not a lot of variation. Only certain tracks are going to be near power plants. And then you can see the Superfund site is negative, but once I put in your census tract fixed effect, it even goes away, because there's not, there's not much really variation then within the tract. Okay. But people, obviously, no one wants to live near a Superfund site. And even big businesses, even manufacturing, doesn't want to locate near a highly toxic place. There's, maybe their employees won't even want to come to work. I mean, that's not surprising to me. That's not surprising that there's an overall effect there. OK, so let's talk about a little bit about some of the other results that we found, sort of away from the base model. OK, so we considered the spatial spillovers of some of our, of our, some of our pollution variables and agglomeration measures to see if 
basically there are some additional effects from the surrounding tracks. And what we find is that there's some crowding out overall of more businesses in surrounding areas, which you can see this negative and statistically significant effect from just more businesses per, per square mile. So there's some crowding out there. Industry numbers, however, this may be even further evidence of sort of a cluster is that you have multiple census tracts kind of in, with businesses in the same industry nearby, then it's even more likely you're going to locate there. That's what that's saying. And then we don't find any additional effect on the spatial spillovers of these other, these other measures that we used. Um, and I didn't interact some of the other ones just because there's so little variance over time. I didn't think we'd get any additional explanatory value, but I could try it. Okay, so now to the conclusion, and then I'll have time for more questions. <laughs> so understanding what drives business location and the location of new employment is very complex, okay? If it wasn't complex, then you know, policymakers would be able to say, we know how we can get this business here. One of, one of the things I hope you saw from my results is that by focusing on manufacturing or just putting all the industries together, pulling them together, then it ignores this complexity. And you might even, because we saw that number of polluting businesses was positive, it might sort of support this idea that it's okay to have pollution, it'll still recruit businesses. And maybe in the case of manufacturing it will, and we saw some evidence of that, but are those the businesses you wanna recruit? So what we find is that when you dig deeper, when you try to look at these different industries separated, you find that obviously it's not the case. In fact, there are firms that are definitely less likely to to locate in these polluted areas or these industrialized, degraded areas. So since there's also quite a bit of evidence of localization economies, then to us that says there's this double whammy. So you have pollution that's repelling firms, some of whom are in the most highly, you know, in the industries that are growing the most, locating the most firms, but because they don't want to go there, then that prevents agglomeration, and then that means you're even less likely to be able to keep up with these kind of new service-oriented and other firms, which is where most of the growth has been. Okay? Did I skip one? No, I didn't. Okay. So for regions with industrial and pollution legacies, as they start to look at the restructuring of their economies, they do need to understand how businesses in different industries make location decisions. I mean, we definitely recognize what one of um, the people at said earlier, that these decisions are different. They're not the same for manufacturing as they are for these other industries. And we suggest that if localities want to attract certain types of businesses, they may have issues if they continue to have high densities of pollution, polluting businesses or air pollution or other factors that are about their, in terms of degradation of their lo locality. What I think is important to note, though, is that while we focus this analysis on work in the greater Cleveland metropolitan area, similar crowding out of businesses could occur in localities in any highly developed area with a manufacturing legacy, including parts of greater Los Angeles. And so policymakers may need to consider not just firm recruitment, but, pol but policies to clean up abandoned sites clean up existing industries in order to attract these high growth firms in other industries. In terms of our next steps, we are doing some work to try to further disaggregate the data to try to get even more at this, you know, sort of industry specific decision making and the heterogeneity and firm location decisions. And we're trying to look at potentially, maybe not in this paper, but at future work of trying to understand the factors that specifically affect location decisions in high growth industries. And with that, thank you so much. Um, what was the effect of the house price? I'm not sure I It was, it was almost, we didn't interact it, but it was always positive. Because there's another interpretation of it that I, <clears throat> I was floating in my head, which is the hostility factor that richer people are more hostile to industries that they consider unpleasant and uh, lowering their, 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 price, their prices. So they might be more favorable towards restaurants and arts 
but it's certainly not towards manufacturing. So I thought the interactive it would be interesting to see how that played out, because. Yeah, we might have enough, that's actually a variable we have enough variation in. I think I will. I mean, for the most part, I've been interacting the things that I was interested in examining, but right. definitely, I mean, it, at the, when we do the census track fix and facts, we, you know, it's harder <coughs> to get any kind of, oh, actually, with that one, we can still get some, some insight. But some of these other variables, because they don't change over time, we can't get. But I'll take a look at that and see if I interact it. That's a good idea. Right now, I'm just controlling in terms of actual local pollution. I'm controlling for air pollution since not all these places have anywhere that water, I mean, unless they're along the lake or along the river, there's not really a water pollution aspect to their tract, right? Um, in terms of noise pollution, you know, that's why I like being able to use the census tract fixed effects because hopefully it's starting to pick up these things I'm not able to actually explain, right? So if after controlling for thing, everything else that's going on in that tract, I'm still capturing some of these negative effects from pollution and things like that, then I can at least say something about those effects. But I don't believe I have, beyond the controls that I'm using here, you know, like proximity to, you know, airports and, and transportation network and some of those, I'm not sure how I would measure noise pollution at a level that would allow me to have anything meaningful. But hopefully I'm a, with a sense of track fixed effects, I'm capturing some of that stuff, even though I can't explain it, I guess is, that's the idea, right? You're capturing everything else that I can't explicitly model, but, and I'm not saying anything about that stuff, but if I still have effects from these other things after that, then these things that I can say something about. So um, next year or the year after, we will have a, a big data source somewhere of micro level noise indicators. Oh. And then Heather will be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, last question. question. Actually, it occurred to me that, um, you know, putting the, uh, the manufacturing industry and the uh, TRI, you know, air pollution uh, data as the independent variables, they, they might be a multiplinary issue or some kind of endogenous issues because, you know, the, the manufacturing industry does produce the, the air pollution that feeds back to the TRI data, so they're kind of interacting. And that's why I use lag data to try to account for that. Um, yeah, I don't know how I can model the decision looking at different industries with and, and look at the effect of pollution without using pollution data. So that's, I'm hoping to account for that to some degree by the lag data. And then when my dependent variable is manufacturing firms, it's new manufacturing firms. So they're not the ones that created the, the pollution. That's my control variable. So that gets a little bit away from that endogeneity. Um, if I was just using total manufacturing firms, I completely agree. And some of the studies, instead of looking at new firms, they, or new establishments, you know, they say, how many firms are in an area? Because of all the endogeneity issues, I didn't even want to go there. And also because policymakers are, you know, their thing is, I want to get a new firm, right? I mean, the existing firms, they're like, those are there. They want to know how they can get a new one. So since I, I, I try to focus this as a sort of more policy oriented, but also to avoid some of these issues, I don't use dependent variable as all manufacturing firms. So the, the TRI data, even if it's from a manufacturing firm, it's not from the firm that's the dependent variable. It could be correlated with the, um, the localization measures though, right? The historic number of manufacturing firms, for sure. Those could be correlated. And so, but we're still getting strong effects on both. So even though they may be correlated, it's, it's, there's still some differences in the impact. But that's, that's a, good, a good point. I mean, there's a lot of potential endogeneity, which is why I was really careful to use lagged, lagged variables and new firms so that they're, they're different. Okay, well, obviously, you generated some interest here. So thank you well, very I'm much. Glad. Every, every